Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing clathrin-mediated endocytosis and the endocytic pathway. Okay, so we're still on clathrin-mediated endocytosis at the moment. So we've seen how if we've got a target protein in the membrane of the cell which we want to endocytose, then that target protein will have exposed on its cytoplasmic uh, domain some sort of endocytic motif, whether this is the NXXY endocytic motif or the YXXY endocytic motif. Okay, and this endocytic motif is what the adapter protein complex 2 is going to bind to. Okay, and we've also seen how the adapter protein complex 2 is targeted to the plasma membrane via its interaction with the C2B domain of synaptotagmin 1 slash 2. Okay, so now what we want to look at is the next step. And to understand the next step, we need to introduce the key player, the player after which the entire process is named. We need to introduce clathrin. Okay, so clathrin. So, clathrin uh, proteins. Clathrin has two chains. It has a heavy chain and a light chain. So let me show you the clathrin heavy chain first. So the clathrin heavy chain is often compared to a leg, basically. Uh, well, sorry, I have to be very careful here uh, because I'm probably educating medics here. So to a lower limb is what I actually meant there. The leg in anatomy is not what the leg is in common speech. Okay, the leg as people would generally use in common speech is really what is called the lower limb. So, let me give you a picture. So, here's a thigh, okay, then we've got a leg here, okay, and a foot here. So, this entire structure, this is what an anatomist or a medical student would call, or who has just studied anatomy at least anyway, would call the lower limb, okay? This bit here, with the quadriceps in and the um, hamstrings and all of that, uh, this bit's known as the thigh, strictly speaking, okay? And this portion here, where the tibia and the fibula, fibula are, this is what is strictly in anatomy, the leg. So it's not the entire thing, basically, it's this bit here. Okay, and then finally there's the foot here. Right, so why is the clathrin compared to being a leg? Uh, sorry, a lower limb? Well, basically, this portion here is like the thigh. Then, sort of flexed over, you've got the legs so as though it's bent back like this. And then incredibly flexed back, which you could never actually do. Incredibly plantar flexed back. Plantar flexion, remember, is the process of taking your foot down like this, okay? So when you stand on your tiptoes, you're plantar flexing. Okay, now if you could plantar flex to the point that your foot was actually back here, then that would kind of look like the uh, clathrin heavy chain here. So this is plantar, and I don't know if it's all one word, I think it actually might be plantar flexion. Right, never mind. Okay, so that's why the clathrin heavy chain is often compared to the lower limb in human anatomy. So this is a uh, clathrin heavy chain. Now, these different portions that correspond to different portions of the leg, they also have different names. So, let's see the names of the different portions of the clathrin heavy chain now. So, this portion here, which is analogous to the thigh, uh, this is called the proximal domain of the clathrin heavy chain. So this is the proximal domain. And you'll see what it's proximal to when we tr discuss what a clathrin trischelion is. Okay. And here, this portion that's analogous to the leg, this is what's known as the distal domain of the clathrin heavy chain. So this is the distal domain. And then finally, the bit that's analogous to the foot, uh, where am I going to write this? It will have to come down here. This is what's known as the N-terminal domain. So the N-terminal domain. Okay, now, this is one clathrin heavy chain. So let me colour it in, in this vivid purple colour here. So let me do it nice and carefully. There's the clathrin heavy chain there. Now, a clathrin heavy chain gets together with another clathrin protein known as a clathrin light chain. So let me draw the clathrin light chain here. So this is a clathrin light chain, and I'll do this 
in a turquoise colour, and the Claflin light chain associates with the proximal domain of the Claflin heavy chain. So in turquoise, and I'm going to have to write it over here because there just isn't space over there, that is a Claflin light chain. Okay, and now what you've got is a clathrin protein. So when people refer to the clathrin protein, they actually mean this dimerization of the clathrin heavy chain with the clathrin light chain. Okay, so proteins. The difference between a protein and a polypeptide is that proteins can be made up of multiple polypeptides. A polypeptide is a single polymer of amino acids. Okay, now in some cases, the single polymer of amino acids that functions on its own, and that will be a protein. Yes, so a single polypeptide can be a protein, but when they fold up together with multiple polypeptides, that's also a protein, a single protein. So it's just a protein that has a tertiary structure, basically, which is meaning that you've brought multiple polypeptides together to make it. Okay, so this is a clathrin protein, then. Now, you don't actually find clathrin proteins in the cytoplasm of the cell. They don't go around on their own. They actually get into bigger structures still. They get into a structure known as a clathrin triskelion. So let me now show you the structure of a clathrin triskelion. Because this is really essential for understanding how the clathrin actually forms this structure that buds off a vesicle. Okay, so the clathrin triskelion then. So firstly, let's start off with our single clathrin heavy chain here. So this is our single clathrin heavy chain. And it's going to now join with another clathrin heavy chain. And I haven't put the light chains on yet. I'll do that in a moment. So here's another clathrin light chain. Uh, sorry, clathrin heavy chain. So we've got now two clathrin heavy chains. Let me just show this. Here's one here. This is the proximal domain, the distal domain, the N-terminal domain. Here's another one, the proximal domain, the distal domain, the N-terminal domain, okay? And then you put in another one here, okay? Like so, okay? And it looks like a rather horrible symbol that reminds us of a horrible portion of history. Um, but this is what track clathrin forms, clathrin triskelions. Okay, so... Uh, let's now add the light chains in. So we've got three heavy chains, and all of the heavy chains will have their light chains. So here's a heavy light chain, here's a light chain, and here's a light chain. One on each of the clathrin heavy chains. Okay, and this now, then, this trimer of clathrin proteins, because remember a clathrin protein was a clathrin heavy chain with a clathrin light chain. This is what's known as a clathrin triskelion. Right, so... What's going to happen then? Okay, so these clathrin triskelions are going to come and bind to the appendages of the adapter protein complex 2. So let me remind you of where we'd got to in the story. So we've got our plasma membrane here. It doesn't hurt to revise. We've got our target protein here with its endocytic motif. We've got our synaptotagmin 1 slash 2 protein here. Okay. And basically, what's come and bound is this adapter protein complex 2. So here's the beta adaptin protein here, with its Mickey Mouse ear. Okay, here's the alpha adaptin protein here. Okay, and they've formed, they've bound together, and they've got these two other proteins in the middle, the sigma and the mu adaptin proteins. Okay, and I know I haven't really brilliantly shown this endocytic motif bound to the adaptin, uh, adapter protein complex 2, but never mind, you know what is happening. This has bound to this. So this is the adapter protein complex 2. This is C2B. Just to add in that we know that PIP2 is somehow important in this process of C2B binding to the adapter protein complex 2. We'll put this in here. This is PIP2 in this little purple dot. Okay, so now what's going to happen is that our clathrin triskelion is going to come and bind to this adapter protein complex 2. This side of the adapter protein complex 2, where the appendages are, the ears of the adapter protein complex 2. And what's going to start happening is that you're going to start polymerizing 
the Claflin Trischelians together. So, let me show you what it means to polymerize Claflin Trischelians together. Basically, when they start polymerizing, they form a buckyball structure. So, if you've ever done chemistry, or if you play football, you'll know what a buckyball structure is. Uh, you're most likely to have done chemistry. So, um, your buckyball structure basically is made up of tessellating um, pentagons and hexagons. So, let me try, attempt to draw a buckyball. I won't be able to actually do it because it's a three-dimensional structure. But, what you can imagine is you start off with a pentagon. So here's our pentagon. Now the pentagon is in the plane of the page. So the pentagon is perfect, basically. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to add a hexagon onto all three, five rather, sides of this pentagon. Now, you can't do this. We're going to add regular hexagons. You can't do this and keep it within the plane of the paper. Well, you can, but they won't fit together. If you try and keep them in the plane of the paper, the hexagons, the sides of the hexagons won't fit together. Instead, there'll be a gap between them. So instead, if you want to join the hexagons together, what you have to do is lift them out of the plane of the paper. So, here come these hexagons, and they are lifting out of the plane of the paper, okay? So these hexagons are all coming out of the plane of the paper, and they're all joined both to the pentagons and to each other. And that's the important thing, that if we didn't join them together, then we could draw this in the plane, but there would be like a gap between uh, neighbouring hexagons. So if we want them all joined together, what has to happen is you have to hold them out of the plane of the piece of paper. And if you're fancy a, a, a fun uh, do-it-yourself activity, what you can actually do is cut out regular pentagons and regular hexagons, all with the same length sides. And if you do it well, you'll actually be able to build one of these structures. You'll actually be able to stick the pentagons and hexagons together and make a 3D buckyball. Okay. I think math students generally do it to understand some sort of rotational group, I think. Um, anyway, you've um, got your um, pentagon here with your hexagons around it, and the hexagons are all coming out, so they're starting to form like a bowl structure, basically. Then what you do is you continue on. You put pentagons in these sockets here, so you've got these two sides here, and what you're going to do is attach two more sides, like that, and then one side connecting them up to make a five-sided shape. So a pentagon's going to go in there, you're going to also put a pentagon in here, and these pentagons, again, they're going to be coming out, forming more of this sort of bowl structure. Okay, so like so. Here's another pentagon here. And I'm not drawing these properly, actually. They need to be sort of like that, because they're coming almost vertically out. They'll still be slightly slanted, but they'll almost be vertical. And then around each of these pentagons, what you'll do is you'll put hexagons, and everything will sort of tessellate beautifully together. And gradually, as you keep doing this, it'll fold back over, and you'll form like a football shape. So what you'll get in the end is a... Um, is a uh, football shape. If you want intuition for it, just find a football and look at the football, because they are this structure. Okay, but we'll approximate it as a sphere. Okay, so the proper name for this shape is what's known as a buckyball, and it's the shape that Buckminster Fullerene forms. Okay, right. So, how do Claflin Trischelians form this when they polymerize? Well, basically, if I draw a Claflin Trischelian on here, let's put a Claflin Trischelian here, here, and here. So here are the three um, heavy chains of the Claflin Trischelian. Here comes its... Um, here. This is the proximal domain, sorry. Here's the uh, distal domain, and here's its foot. This here's another Claflin heavy chain, so this is this one here. And here's the proximal domain, here's the distal domain, here's its foot. Here's the final proximal domain, so this is this, and then here's its um, distal domain, and then here's its foot. Okay, and then they'll also have their um, light chains sitting alongside them still. So here's this one's light chain, here's this one's light chain, and here's this one's light chain. Okay, now, Claflin Trischelians do not perfectly tessellate. They don't, it's not perfect. They don't perfectly make this buckyball. Okay, it's not quite like Buckminster Fullerene, where it's absolutely perfect. Instead, what you'll have is you'll have overlapping 
Clathrin triskelions. So maybe we'll put another Clathrin triskelion where the center of the Clathrin triskelion is here. So here are the three proximal domains coming off of here. And then what will happen is you'll have this heavy chain going like this. Here's its uh, distal domain and its foot. Here's another one. This is its proximal domain. Here's its distal domain. Here's its foot. And then, oh, look at this one here. Here's its proximal domain. Then its distal domain will go back over where this other Clathrin triskelion was. And then its foot will also overlap. So basically, they don't perfectly tessellate. Instead, you get overlap. But the point is that they do overall polymerize together to form a buckyball-like structure. And this is going to happen at the membrane. And we'll see the consequences of that in the next video.